This is a conversation about evolutionary psychology with Glenn Geher, professor at the State University of New York at New Paltz for 45 Graus, a podcast based in Portugal. The conversation falls right after this very brief introduction in Portuguese. Bem-vindos ao 45 Graus. Neste episódio estou à conversa com Glenn Geher sobre psicologia evolutiva. É, já perceberam, o mesmo tema do episódio anterior em que o convidado foi Paulo Finuras. O Paulo falou-me de alguns nomes de referência nesta área e como acho que o tema merece, decidi aproveitar para chamar um convidado internacional ao podcast, o que já era uma ideia antiga. É por isso também a primeira conversa em inglês. Peço desculpa por não haver dobragem ao estilo das rádios generalistas, mas falta-me ainda orçamento para isso. Glenn Geher é professor na State University of New York at New Paltz, uma das melhores universidades públicas dos Estados Unidos e um investigador de referência na área da psicologia evolutiva. Tem publicado vários livros sobre este tema, com destaque para Evolutionary Psychology 101, o mais recente, e também Mating Intelligence Unleashed, The Role of the Mind in Sex, Dating and Love. Falámos então de temas que cruzam estes dois livros, como a origem evolutiva do humor, um fenómeno misterioso porque parece não ter nenhuma finalidade prática, a origem das diferenças culturais entre povos e das diferenças de personalidade entre as pessoas, este último já foi tema, aliás, de um episódio do podcast, e também as diferenças de comportamento entre os sexos. Falámos também das críticas mais comuns a esta área da psicologia evolutiva, que é fascinante, mas também cientificamente controversa e pode levar-nos a conclusões demasiado superficiais e precipitadas. Foi uma ótima conversa, espero que gostem. E como diria Lauro Dérmio... Vamos ver uma trailer. Let's look at the trailer. Ok. Uh, Glenn, yes. thank you very much for, for accepting the invitation. I'm very, very pleased to have a first uh, international guest on the podcast. So this is a first for me. This is actually the second time uh, this topic comes to the, the podcast. I've had a conversation with uh, Paul Finuras, who, who is a Portuguese guy who is kind of a lone uh, promoter or preacher of this topic in, in Portugal. In your case, you have, you have uh, already some books about this topic. Uh, the latest one, Evolutionary Psychology 101, which is... I've read only a bit of it, and I think I can recommend it, recommend it as a great introduction to, to the topic. You've had one before, which you co-wrote with, with Scott Kaufman, right? Mating Intelligence Unleashed. Um, right. That's more on a focused topic. So uh, feel free to, to direct listeners to, to each of, of those books or, or any other publication uh, along the conversation. Very, very quickly, let's describe generally the topic before we dive into more specific topics, uh, even if it's the second time we, we've talked about it. But I feel this is a topic that may be some, somewhat difficult for people to, to understand because it's simple in a way, but, but at least very counterintuitive. So um, I found this description in your book, and I'll ask you to comment very briefly. I think it summarizes perfectly the topic, this field. You said that at its core, evolutionary psychology is an approach to human behavior that takes evolutionary theory into account. And I'll describe this in another way as seeing human behavior also as part of the natural world, uh, which is not usually done in the so social sciences. Um, do you have anything you should you want to add on this? Yeah, well, first off, uh, Jose, thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm really excited to, to be speaking to a Portuguese audience. <laughs> um, so this is a great opportunity for me. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a big advocate of the field of evolutionary psychology. I've been teaching classes and doing research in this field for, I guess, over two decades at this point mm -hmm. um and like you said i'm i'm you know i'm very excited about it and, and i'm very uh very interested in introducing a lot of the basic ideas to people um so my book evolutionary psychology 101 <clears throat> was designed as as really just a foundational introduction to the field and like you're saying it it's about um, looking at human behavior as being part of the natural world is one way to, to frame it. Um, in a broader sense, we can think about human behavior as we can think about the behavior of any animal. Um, and that's really what the evolutionary psychology perspective does, is it approaches human behavior the way we would approach the behavior of any animal. When, when you think about the behavior of any animal, you can ask the question, well, what is behavior in the first place? Why does behavior exist? Mm -hmm. And, you know, then we can start thinking about, well, why does any feature of an organism exist? And really the answer sort of powerfully comes back to evolutionary processes such as natural selection. Um, so natural selection is a process by which 
life forms have come about over um, millions and millions of years. And, the, you know, it's a process that Charles Darwin discovered um, that has been substantiated um, by lots of, you know, scholars in all different fields, geneticists and uh, paleontologists and anthropologists providing evidence for natural selection. What natural selection does is it essentially selects features of organisms that outcompete alternative features. So if there's some feature of one organism that increases the ability to survive or the ability to reproduce, then by definition, that feature is going to be more likely to exist into the future. And more mm -hmm. offspring, more descendants will have whatever that feature is compared with alternative features. So that's the basic idea of natural selection. And human evolutionary psychology simply applies that reasoning to everything about human behavior. Exactly. Great explanation. And it gives me kind of a segue to to um, a complementary feature of selection or complementary to natural selection uh, or another side of it, which is sexual selection or, or in a broader sense, uh, social selection. Uh, a lot of your, of your work has been actually about that. And there's, there's somewhat of a, of a puzzle that I've had for a long time, and I think it, it can start at least being explained by, by sexual selection, which is the existence of humor. Mm -hmm. Humor is very, very complex, and actually can talk a bit about that. And we all know, for instance, that, uh, for instance, comedians are disproportionately um, men. So th th there's more men than women uh, comedians. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of women who are, co who are comedians, but we know that, that humor, at least cult culturally, it's more of, a, more of a feature of men, which leads me to the intuition that it may have to do with signaling for sexual uh, selection and that it arose uh, in that sense. And actually... My intuition goes a bit further, and I actually think that it can also be explained by, by a narrower theory, uh, that is the, the, the handicap theory or the, or the handicap principle, in that when I try and think of it, uh, humor sometimes is, is a way of one boasting that I'm so comfortable with this situation that I can make fun of it, or that, mm -hmm. or that I can crack a joke. I don't know, uh, what's your view of this? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good way of, of putting it. I think that if someone has a, a really good sense of humor, is, is noted for a sense of humor. I think you're right. I think there's a certain comfort level that that person has. I think that person um, is able to understand a situation and is able to understand it at a higher level, at a different level where they can sort of comment back on the situation. Mm -hmm. And these are things that we find attractive in mates. So one of the things in, in the field of evolutionary psychology, since we're interested in qualities that ultimately increase survival and or reproductive success, anything that increases the ability to attract a mate is something that is of strong interest to the field of evolutionary psychology. Um, so there's a puzzle, and you got into this a little bit, Jose, and I think I'm going to elaborate a little mm -hmm. bit on sure, sure, go ahead. Sure, uh, I'll elaborate on some of the details. Um, but there's a puzzle about human beings, which has to do with what we might call the human uniqueness problem. Um, you know, every species by definition is unique. They have their own niche. They have their own ways of, of they have their own adaptations and ways of dealing with um, things in their environment. But with that said, humans are very unique. I mean, um, chimpanzees can put a stick into a log and get a bunch of termites out and, and eat the termites. But we can put a man on the moon, you know, or we, we can communicate with someone across the ocean in, in real time. You know, I mean, the things that humans have been able to do is, is absolutely amazing. So a lot of evolutionary scholars have addressed that question of why? Why are humans so unique? Why did we end up taking on this form? Part of it has to do with why do we have our um, extraordinary levels of creativity? Um, why do we have the kinds of art forms that we have? Why do we have advanced mathematical abilities? Why can we write novels? Why do we have um, advanced linguistic capabilities that we have and, and so forth? Now, there have been a lot of great answers that I think have partially answered that question. Um, but the one that relates mostly to what you're talking about now regarding humor was put forward by my collaborator, Jeffrey Miller. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Jeffrey Miller, in a huge integration of evolutionary biology and human evolutionary psychology, came up with this idea that um, a lot of our complex human behavior is what, what might be called um, 
costly signaling um, <laughs> or, or uh, I guess there's a couple other ways or fitness indicators that, mm-hmm. that a lot of the things we do are we're like signaling things about ourselves um, in order to attract a mate. Now, signaling to attract a mate is nothing new, and we see that in any sexually reproducing species. Um, bird songs that you hear in the mornings this, this time of year, at least here in North America, there's all kinds of songbirds. Mm. Um, they're, they're attracting mates. You know, that's part of what they're doing is they're, they're looking for mates. Um, uh, fish have different colors. Um, salmon have bright pink colors in the, in the Pacific Northwest. And the brighter the color, the more likely it is that a, a, a salmon of the opposite sex will be attracted to them. You know, mate, looking for signals in, mate, in courtship is a very common thing across the animal kingdom. What, what Jeffrey Miller proposes is that when you see those signals that seem to be really specific to a particular species, they e- those features evolve because they reveal something inside the person. They reveal something about the person's health, or they might even reveal something about the person's um, genome or that person's DNA. So if, if we're looking to mate with someone and we're going to produce offspring, all things equal, you're better off producing offspring with someone who has high quality genes or high quality DNA. So what Miller essentially argues is that a lot of the things that we um, have that are complex human behaviors that don't seem to have a survival function, um, such as creative intelligence, the ability to um, do fantastic pieces of artwork, the ability to coordinate a large group of people in a symphony or something like this, that these are things that evolved not because they help survival, but rather they serve as courtship mechanisms in our species. Um, And so humor fits all those criteria. Humor is one of these things that is, um, it's species typical, meaning we see humor in humans across the globe. Um, It does not have obvious survival benefits. It is hard to fake. So another thing about these costly (laughs) uh, signals, right, is like someone could try to be funny, but if if that person's not funny, you know, no one's really going to buy it. So I think humor is one of these things that you sort of have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's related to general intelligence, which is related to all different parts of the brain, um, which is ultimately related to lots of parts of our DNA or our genome. Um, So humor seems to be a very good candidate for a costly signal in in human courtship. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And and if you interpret it in the context of the human culture, is actually not only that you can only do it if you are fun, uh, if you're funny, but you can also only do it if you are in the position to do it. So someone who is in the lower ranks of society is not in a position to engage in humor. You have to you have to have a certain uh, uh, power or, or prestige. Uh, at least that that's that would be my intuition, and it leads me to the kind of my second intuition about humor. Uh, because I, as I said, humor is very it's very complex. Uh, we know it. It's puzzling, as you said, because it has to be useful for it to be se- selected by by nature, in a sense, uh, or or by or by the other sex in this case. But but it is very it's it's varied. And another rule uh, that I think it may have or it may have taken is in the moderation of the of the dominance hi- hierarchy. So this is uh-huh. another feature of of this of, of evolutionary psychology, which which is the fact that unlike chimps, for instance, for instance, that you've mentioned before, we have evolved from a pure dominance hierarchy to a more prestige based one. Uh, and I guess you, another side of humor would be to to counteract power. So I, 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 maybe maybe this I'm fabulating a bit, but I imagine uh, uh, in a tribe uh, you have the the most powerful individual in that tribe, uh, and and if during the, the the evening and around the the fireplace someone starts starts impersonating that leader and and mocking some of his features, that acts as as a, as a counterweight to to his or, or her, her power. I don't know what's your view your view on this on this very superficial theory. Uh, no, I think it's a really interesting idea, um, and there have been scholars who have examined essentially, like you're saying, dominance hierarchies uh-huh. in terms of humor's effects and studying that from an evolutionary perspective. 
Um, there are effects of how high you are in the dominance hierarchy in terms of what kinds of humor are perceived as effective or not. Mm. Um, leaders, people that are in high status positions who use self-deprecating humor, mm. that seems to be very effective. Um, so if someone's a leader but is, is um, you know, admitting that he or she doesn't have all the answers to everything and has shortcomings and has flaws, that usually is very effective. Um, at getting people to like that person and getting people to be motivated. Um, leaders who use um, humor that sort of is, is insulting or that is biting or that is, you know, hurting others, that's not considered um, as attractive uh, of a form of humor. So the kind of humor that someone at the very top uses seems to vary. And when, you know, when a leader is using something that is hurting other people that's almost seen as an exploitation of power mm -hmm. um so i think that's pretty consistent with what with what you're with what you're talking about and i think you're right i think people that are sort of quote lower on the totem pole um use different kinds of humor it's not that they don't have humor but i think that the kind of humor that is effective for them and that is appropriate um is different and i do think that future work in this area could really go very far in sort of elaborating on you know, the, the evolutionary psychology of humor in human uh, social context and in terms of dominance hierarchies. I think that's a really a great area for research. Yes, I think it's, I think it's absolutely fascinating. Let me switch to um, a, a different topic on this field uh, sure. that also puzzles me a bit. One of the um, principles of this evolutionary psychology is that the characteristics it studies, as it were, are universal to humankind. So they exist, they exist across the world and they are, they are specific to, to humankind. There are two puzzles that I, I take from this. One of them is the existence of different cultures and the other is the existence of different personalities. <laughs> the, for me, sure. there are two puzzles of this. Let, let's start with, uh, with culture. Again, my intuition would be that the existence of different cultures are simply, or, or we can posit that they are simply different equilibria uh, as adaptations to, to the in, in different environments of the same human general uh, uh, characteristics, uh, so, so to say. What, what's your view on that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that you're totally right on that. I think that, you know, human beings are the same across the globe. Uh, and the, the older I get and the more places I travel, the more that I firmly believe that. Um, Cultures vary, but cultures vary to the extent that um, cultures have their own history, they have their own geography, they have their own environmental context and their own environmental background. So, you know, if you're if you're in a nomadic culture, then, you know, nomadic cultures have an entire culture of people sort of supporting one another in a more collectivistic kind of mm -hmm. manner and, and sharing of, of food in a certain kind of way is a really important aspect of, of what they do. And so when you have those elements of a culture, well, that's partly because that's the nature of the lifestyle that those people have. Um, so when you see cultural differences, it often makes sense in terms of, you know, what is the environment like? What is the lifestyle like? I, I'll give you a, a pretty strong example from a recent experience of, of mine. Um, so for the first time ever, I recently came back from China. Mm -hmm. where I, I spent 10 days teaching a group of really bright students um, about evolutionary psychology, which I, I don't think a lot of people have taught in China before. So the students were pretty interested in it. And I got to tell you, I was really, I learned so much and I was really interested in the culture and the people. And, you know, one of the things about China is it's famous for being what we call very collectivistic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you could definitely see that, that people, People define themselves not in terms of themselves, but in terms of their families or in terms of their, you know, their people or even in terms of their nation. Um, you know, they're very, very collectivistic. That's the case of Portugal, too, by the way. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So and, and it's very, you know, in the United States, it's very different. And, you know, one of the reasons that I think that it works in, in China. I'll give you one example. I, I went to a museum about something called the Three Gorges Hydroelectric mm. Plant Project. Well, that's the biggest electronic electric generator in the entire world. And they had to displace millions of people 
to be able to put that in. And there was this whole museum about the history of it and everything. And one of my students, I remember she said to me, it was very funny. She said, when I learned about this in high school, my teacher said that they could never do this in America because the Americans would never get up and, and move. <laughs> and I, thought, I thought, you know, I said, that's exactly <laughs> right. I said, that's, I thought it was very insightful, you know, and I'm sure there was, it wasn't perfect, but the fact that that project succeeded and went through depended on a collectivistic mindset. Without that collectivistic mindset, they would have had too much difficulty in making it happen. Well, it's also a country that has a population that's about five or six times the population of the United States, you know? So with that many people, that social environment makes collectivism a much more important and much more functional um, psychological approach to everything. So I think when you do see cultural differences, the, the rules that exist and the policies that exist in certain cultures make sense for that culture, you know, and if, if I were raised in China, I'm sure I would be more likely to have those values and, you know, human beings are flexible. We, we evolve to learn the details of our culture and to be effective within that particular culture. I think that's part of um, part of the human evolutionary story. Mm. Yeah, th this th that topic of cultural differences is is another fascinating one. There's there's the work of of uh, Hofstede. I don't know if you're mm -hmm. familiar with it. Um, I've t actually I've talked uh, a lot of times about his work in the podcast, uh, and in the case of of collectivism. As I said, Portugal is not too far from China in that regard, mm -hmm. uh, which is which makes it makes for an inter interesting comparison. And actually, if I, I think if you analyze it, every culture is 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 collectivist. So it's not a question of of collectivism versus individualism, uh -huh. but rather different uh, values uh, in in of, of of collectivism. So even the U.S. It, it's less collectivistic rather than than individ individualistic. I, I would say. And evolutionarily, collectivism makes all the sense because people who, who stayed within the tribe were much more likely to survive than than the loners who, who basically left the tribe and went went elsewhere or were expelled from from, from the tribe. Actually, I've I've read something about this that uh, this is also an interesting part of this topic that we have we've evolved not only to have these values but to have. Uh, to experience uh, these these traits, these these characteristics, in a physical way. Uh, so we we you probably know this much better than me, but uh, uh, I found it very interesting. If we th the way we experience rejection, so being expelled from a group, uh, mm -hmm. uh, is is in the same place of our brain uh, of a physical pain we feel if if someone hurts us, which wow. which is fascinating. And and in the case of collectivism, going back to what I was saying, yeah, my my intuition is that. Collectivism is a response, uh, and then we know from the data that as societies get richer, as people get richer, uh, they become less collectivist, uh, which is uh, basically just is the exception that proves the rule, because it's telling oh. us exactly that they don't need anymore to right. be collectivist. Because they have their own, they got their own resources. Exactly. Uh, absolutely. You know, I've I've done uh, one of my recent recent research projects is on the evolutionary psychology of estrangements. Um, which connects very mm -hmm. much with what you're talking exactly. about. So, you know, an estrangement is is when two people won't talk to each other ever again. Um, and, you know, it's it's a very unpleasant situation. And like you're saying, when, when someone is ostracized, when someone is cut out of the group, that hurts in a very visceral sense. I mean, the fact that you're saying that it triggers the same pain receptors that are found in the brain for physical pain, that makes so much sense from an evolutionary perspective. Um, w one of the things that this field um, focuses on is the fact that there's a very big mismatch between modern, the modern world, especially if you're um, not a hunter and gatherer, if you live in a city or, a, you know, quote, a civilization, um, under ancestral conditions, until agriculture existed, human groups were never bigger than about 150 because mm -hmm. nomadic groups, there's a practical constraint. You can't bring 10, 20, 30,000 people from, you know, this part of the country over to this part of the country. It just doesn't work. So human groups were capped because of ecological conditions at about 150. Within those groups, you were mostly finding people that you were related to. So you had your relatives or your kin 
And then the other kind of person in the group was people that you had long-standing relationships with and that your family had long-standing relationships with. So that's the human mind evolved, not for large cities, not for modern, um, the modern westernized world. Our minds evolved for small scale groups where we were going to see the same people every single day. Now, in that kind of condition, if you were kicked out of the group, you know, if you have a group of 150 and you're kicked out, that's pretty much going to mean death. You mm-hmm. know, being dependent on that group had become at some point in, in our evolutionary history, wickedly important. It was absolutely essential that you had to get along with your group at least enough to be accepted um, at a very basic level. So with this all in mind, we asked people, it was um, about two or 300 college students in the United States, to think about how many people they were currently estranged from. How many people in the world right now are you not on speaking terms with, even though you used to be on speaking terms with? And we fa- we predicted, based on this idea that human minds were really evolved to be connected to others in small groups, we predicted that the higher number of estrangements someone had, the more problems that person was going to have in, in a whole variety of ways. Hmm. Um, we, here, so here's some of the statistics. We found the average amount, the average number of estrangements was about four. Um, and this, I had never thought about this from a cross-cultural perspective, but I think it'd be very interesting to see how that number might differ from country to country. Mm-hmm. Um, so here we have the average is about four. And then we found in the data that there was a small but significant subgroup of people who had 10 or more estrangements in their world with one person having as many as almost 30, 30 people in the world that they are not on speaking terms with. So we looked at that and we looked at, okay, those people that are estranged from a lot of different people, how does that play out in their psychology? And we, what we found was ubiquitous, meaning it was, um, it was relevant to all different kinds of variables. They were depressed. Um, they reported being more anxious. They reported having a, a darker personality. They reported being more narcissistic. Um, mm. They reported being more psychopathic, caring mm. less about other people. More neurotic, I guess. Yes, yes. They scored higher on neuroticism as well. So it was kind of like a whole battery of low-functioning adverse psychological qualities seems to be associated with being cut off from a lot of people. And, and Jose, that totally goes back with your idea saying that the natural state of things for humans really is a collectivistic psychological world. Mm, exactly. And, and in this case, while you were explaining that, I, I, it immediately occurred to me something which I, I think I've read somewhere and I think makes complete, le- complete sense in this lens, that the reason we tend to be so anxious about public speaking is exactly that we, that we, we are hardwired to, to be in, in small groups rather than speaking to 200 yeah. people. Absolutely. And, and if you have, if you have a, the difference between like public speaking, like if you were just going like to give some talk to like your family or some good friends or some people that you've known for a long time over the dinner table, no one gets nervous about that, you yeah. know? No one, gets, but if you're going to do that same exact thing for 200 strangers, the entire situation differs. And I think that you're exactly right. I think that is an evolutionarily mismatched situation. Yeah, let's let's speak about um, the difference of personalities that I that I've broached before. Uh, this again, I think it's an it's somewhat of another puzzle. Given that, uh, why do I think it's a puzzle? Because we are uh, positing that. The, there's a process of selection that selects for these characteristics and not others. Uh, and in that sense, so diverse a range of human personalities may be interpret, interpreted as, as a puzzle. In this regard, my intuition, I'm not completely confident on this one, uh, my intuition would be that uh, this is expl- explained by the fact that we have evolved uh, not only as individual, but more as groups, so as uh, culturally, as, the, the, as you mentioned before. And in a group or, or in a specific cultural environment, uh, you have different people, different roles or different people whose different strategies succeed in, in different ways. And that would lead to different personalities. I, 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 what's, what's your view on this one? Uh, that, you know, it's a really, it's a great question. It's something I've, I've thought about a lot. Um, and I think that you're, 
Your solution, um, it's to be honest, you might not realize it, but it's actually considered a little controversial in the field. Is it? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have no idea. I'm, not, I'm not saying it's considered wrong, but sure, yeah. your solution that it's kind of like a group needs people that come in all different flavors and, mm -hmm. and um, take on all different roles, that kind of assumes what we will call um, multi-level selection, meaning that there's selection forces, not just for individuals to survive and reproduce, but also additional selection forces um, at the at the level of the social unit or the social group so that people that sort of come out in a certain ratio with certain personality traits so that they can fill certain roles for the group, you know, whether evolution actually works that way or functions that way is considered a controversy in the field. But there certainly are people who, um, who advocate for that agenda. But there's a, a slightly different way of thinking about personality differences. Um, mm -hmm which is what we would call balancing selection. And it, it, like you said, it, it's a puzzle. Um, and it is a puzzle because if you think about humans coming about from evolution, and if you think that evolution is selecting traits that are good for survival and reproduction, to some extent you would envision these traits coming to what's called fixation. Mm -hmm. So there's certain traits we have, such as um, generally speaking, we have two feet, we have five fingers on one hand, um, we have two eyeballs. Like there are certain physical traits that are just fixed. You know, this is how, unless there's a, a genetic mutation, this is how all human beings are. But when it comes to personality, we see a lot of variability. And we see variability, interestingly, along the same basic dimensions. So personality psychologists have documented, you know, what, what do we call the foundational trait dimensions of personality. And what we have found is that a lot of these dimensions have poles where we can think of it as balancing selection, or we can think about it as one, um, one end of the trait dimension has benefits but it also has costs. And on the other side of the trait dimension, there are other benefits and there are other costs and these things balance out. Okay. So a as an example, um, one of the most common dimensions thought about is neuroticism, which you talked about before. Hmm. Neuroticism's, um, the opposing pole is, um, is emotional stability. So some people are just, we, we will say in our country, cool as a cucumber, just, you know, easy going, you know, nothing can bother this person. And some people are nervous wrecks, you know, or is, is people are very anxious all the time, or they have large fluctuations in their mood. And you think about it, on the surface, it seems to be better to be stable. I mean, that's the first, you know, and when we think about mental health, the mental health industry tries to reduce anxiety, it rarely tries to increase anxiety or try to make people less stable. So that personality dimension is kind of a puzzle. If it's adaptive to be stable as opposed to neurotic, then why are so many people neurotic? And why does, why does everyone have like a splash of neuroticism in them? Well, the answer ends up being we, we can understand that in terms of um, human evolution. So what are the benefits we know what the benefits of stability are, but what are the benefits of neuroticism? And when people have started looking at that question, what they found is that people that are neurotic tend to be more vigilant. They tend to be more worried that something bad is going to happen. <laughs> and unfortunately in life, bad things do happen. So if you're vigilant, if you're you know, worry that something bad is going to happen, then you're more likely to actually be prepared for all different kinds of things that could happen. Um, if, if, you're, if you're back in the ancestral times of human evolution in the African savanna and you're worried about snakes, you're probably less likely to get killed by a snake because you're vigilant about them, because you're worried about them, because you're anxious about them. If you're worried about kick, getting kicked out of the group, then you might take steps so that you don't get kicked out of the group. And so um, this is how the tendency to be anxious and to be worried actually has adaptive value. And so this is, but, but like I said before, so does being stable. So this is how we end up having variability, how we end up having people of these different kinds. Um, another basic dimension that, that 
we can see that we can think about this way is extroversion. Mm. So extroversion or how outgoing somebody is, how friendly someone is, how willing someone is to talk to a stranger. This is another one that varies wildly. As a teacher, I will sometimes give my students a, a test of introversion and extroversion. And I will ask people after they take the test to stand up and say their scores and it's funny because the people who choose to stand up and say their scores are, the are always people, they score high on extroversion. You know, <laughs> it's a very, it's a classic, um, it's a classic example, but there's, you know, it's obvious the benefits of extroversion also seem kind of obvious. You get to know more people, you connect maybe with more people in some kind of way. Researchers have shown that extroverts have more mating partners. They end up having more sexual partners in their, across their lifespan. However, they also are more likely to die early. They're more likely to die of accidents. They're more likely to have physical accidents. Um, they're more likely to engage in risk-taking. And risk-taking, by definition, doesn't always work out that well. Whereas introverts are less likely to have a lot of different social connections, but they're more likely to have some good, close social connections with a smaller number of people. They're less likely to be risk-taking. They're more likely to take their time in making decisions. And that's beneficial as well. So from an evolutionary perspective, there's costs and benefits to <laughs> both of these extreme personality types. And that's partly, I think, how we can really understand variability in, in personality across individuals. Yeah, this, this is really interesting. You've, you've, you've started closing this or solving this puzzle for, for me. So this is, this is really a big moment. And, and the, the fact that you've, that you've chosen neuroticism as an example is also good because that's the only trait of the, of the big five. And the big five has already been a subject of, of one of the episodes I've recorded. And oh, it's, it's the only one uh, about which we have a, an overwhelmingly negative opinion. Correct. But if you think of it, uh, uh, zero neuroticism, it's obviously not good. So, so having zero of it, uh, it's not good, which means that there's some good in it. Uh, and also something also that you've said, which makes complete sense, and I, I, I confess I had never thought of it that way, is that uh, each trait or each end of the continuum has uh, pros and cons. And in, in nature, uh, we, we imagine like life has a, 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 some of it which is culturally determined, but a lot of it is almost random. So, which means that uh, uh, some of the neurotic people from the past have not reproduced due to the disadvantages of their neuroticism, but also some of the of the um, cool people, as uh, to use your words, of the past have not reproduced because they failed to to predict that a lion would come around the corner and eat them. Which means that th that really solves the puzzle in terms of of explaining uh, of explaining this. Um, and to go back to the um, to my first points on, on on the personality thing, although this I think this this is a great explanation. I still think about, for instance, differences in mating strategies. You see that in both uh, uh, men and women, and I, I know you've studied this a lot. I, I know, for instance, in men, there are at least two different mating strategies. One of them more promiscuous, if you will, so which which means that uh, that person wants to have as many partners as possible, and the other one is to to engage in a monogamous um, relationship, and that's. Those are two evolutionary uh, strategies, right? In, the, in their own uh, right, so to say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can think of mating strategies as in exactly that same kind of way. Mating strategies, to some extent, are differences in, in personality. Um, and there's a, a scientific term, uh, strategic pluralism, which means that <laughs> there is a multitude, a plurality of strategies that, that can evolve to solve the same problem. So the problem is successful mating. Um, on one hand, if you're very good at, at short-term mating and you can mate with a lot of different partners, that might be effective. But there's a cost associated with that because those offspring might not get great parental care. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's something, there's a, a benefit and a cost. And the same thing is true with long-term mating. So long-term mating, if you are really good at settling down and finding one really good partner and having a few offspring, um, you might only end up having two or three kids, but those two or three kids are going to get very high level parental care and have a higher chance of successfully surviving and reproducing. Um, so it's, it's funny that you come at this, Jose, from an ec economist perspective, because <laughs> then that means you under, you totally can see these things in terms 
terms of equilibria, which is exactly how mm-hmm. evolutionary psychologists think about these things. Exactly. And let me talk about a, a, another economic term, uh, markets. There's a puzzle I've, I've always had about what I can call the, the mating market, as it were. Uh, I've listened to a, an interview of yours in which you, you mentioned something that I think is very much related to this. So I, I've noticed, and I think you as well, and, and most of our listeners have noticed that there's kind of an imbalance uh, uh, in, the, in the mating market uh, because it's kind of split. You have the short-term making, mating uh, market in which you have a surplus of men, if you will, and you have then a long-term mating market in which you have a surplus of women. Mm-hmm. And there's something I came across in that, in that interview uh, that I found fascinating. Was, so that you mentioned that research has shown that most women really don't have a, a, a short-term mating strategy. So even if they may seem to engage in short-term relationships and, and hookups, that's really a proxy for, for a short-term re- relationship. While in men, um, I guess you find much more diverse strategies or, or diverse ways of, of, of looking at relationships in terms of, of the outcomes that, that one wants. Uh, am I right? Sure, yeah. So that, that, uh, that, those ideas relate to research that I've done with several colleagues of mine on, on what, what they call hooking up relationships, Mm -hmm. Um, just very short-term casual relationships, very common in colleges and universities in the United States these days. And one of the the ideas we had was that while women might be more likely to engage in short-term mating now than in past times, women's physiology is so geared toward long-term mating because women have all the parental costs associated with getting pregnant and childbirth and breastfeeding that women just really are not anatomically optimized for short-term mating. But short-term mating is what hookup is. Mm-hmm. So we asked women in this study, um, what do you expect to get out of, your, out of the hookup relationship that you had? And a very large majority, much higher than found for men, a very large majority said they were hoping it would last, it would turn into a long-term <laughs> relationship, which is pretty interesting because the, mm-hmm. you know, the definition of a hookup is, you know, no strings attached, you know, everyone's agreeing this is a short-term relationship. But I think, I think that because of the very high parental costs associated with being female, um, we, we found that they, it seemed like they kind of secretly really wanted a long-term relationship out of those relationships, whereas males did not necessarily report that same thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, Glenn, uh, this has been a very fascinating conversation, uh, but I have to let you go. I just, I'll just ask you a final question that I, I think is the right way to, to close our, our conversation. And it wouldn't be serious, so, so to say, to approach this topic without covering the, the common criticisms that, that sometimes are made of, of, about evolutionary psychology, which, as you know, and probably have felt uh, almost on your skin, is, has some degree of controversy on, on it. Um, but I actually, I don't, I don't care too much about the controversy in itself. I care more about the, the scientific rigor uh, of it. And there are two, at least two main topics on which it has, I have seen criticism. One of them is the fact that since evolutionary psychology is focused on characteristics which exist only in the human species and are universal to all humans, the sample size is basically one. So there's, no, there's really no way to, to employ the uh, common scientific method of, 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 of comparison and, and variability uh, analysis. And the other one is, is that there are a lot of assumptions one's, one makes about the environment in which the evolution of the human species uh-huh. occurred that are based on things we, we don't really know too much about uh, because unfortunately we don't, we don't know exactly how our, our past was. I think it would be uh, great to end with, uh, with your comment on these on this two common criticisms. Sure. Um, yeah, the, I think you articulated these well. The, the, the first one has to do with, I guess, like the scientific rigor question. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's been lots and lots of great research in the field of evolutionary psychology that has really, I think, made great advances in spite of hurdles that people have talked about. So some people have said you can't do experimental research in, in evolutionary psychology because we can't manipulate ancestral conditions. Well, in fact, there's a lot of hypotheses that are experimental in nature that have been conducted in evolutionary psychology. Um, there's the criticism that, um, that sometimes 
we're trying to have a hypothesis that's about people, all people in the world, right? So this is kind mm -hmm. of what you were saying, but exactly. we have a very small sample that we study. So it might not be appropriate to make that inference to the larger population. That's a good criticism. And I'll say that a lot of evolutionary psychologists, largely um, my friend Dave Schmidt, who's at Brunel University in London, has made an entire career of collecting cross-cultural data from thousands and thousands of people across the world. Um, one study, I think as many as 60 different uh, countries, um, had participants included. So I think one of the main criticisms um, that our research is making big claims, so we need to, to have to be held to a high standard. Um, uh, you know, one answer to that is, well, good, then let's do better research. And there's a lot of people who, who are doing that. So I think that's been a really strong response to that kind of criticism. Um, the second comment, which has to do with this idea that evolutionary psychologists are making claims about ancestral conditions when by definition, you know, I wasn't there and you weren't there and none of us were, were there. Um, on one hand, I'd say that's reasonable to some extent, but on the other hand, there are things that we absolutely do know about ancestral conditions. We do know um, that our ancestors had to have lived in small groups because all the evidence before agriculture is that all the fossilized remains of humans were small groups. So we know that. Um, we do know that agriculture came about 10,000 years ago. Um, we know that before that, people were nomadic. So we know that our ancestors were nomadic for a very long time. Based on DNA evidence, we know that our ancestors lived in the African savanna until it, there's some argument as to whether it's 200 or 300,000 years ago, but for the lion's share of human evolution, we know that they lived in the African savanna. So the features of the African savanna become important in understanding our ancestral conditions. We know that our ancestors, and this, some of this is going to sound simple, but we know that our ancestors didn't have cell phones. Right? <laughs> now, I don't know about in, in uh, Portugal, but in the United States, almost everybody is physically addicted to their mm -hmm. cell phone, you know, and it's a real problem. Um, so there's a lot of there's while we, we you're, you're right that we definitely don't know exactly what it was like. We can use a lot of um, logical reasoning to figure out things that definitely that definitely had to be true for those ancestors and that definitely were things that they did not have just because they're highly modern. So we can, we can definitely make estimates as to what the world was like. So we can study evolutionary mismatch, I think, if we're just a little bit resourceful in our research design. Hmm. Yeah, it's the, um, the so-called Sherlock Holmes technique, right? There's no, there's no other explanation. If there's no other explanation, it has to be that one. Uh, yeah. I think in the sense that, that it encapsulates it. Uh, yeah. Well, Galen, it has been... A great conversation. Yes. As I said, I'll, I'll, I'm going to let you go. Um, counter to my my willingness, <laughs> which would be to to, to continue uh, the, the conversation forever, because this this is a topic really without without an end in itself. There are so many things that you can explore, and it relates it relates to almost everything that's that's human related. Uh, so so there's really no end to it. That's why it's so fascinating. Uh, thank you for coming on the show. And I'm sure everyone will enjoy very much this episode. Jose, thank you so much for having me. And I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Tem gostado do 45 Graus? Nesse caso, não deixem de seguir a página do podcast no Facebook e, se utilizarem iOS, de o avaliar no iTunes. Para além disso, não hesitem em enviar questões ou sugestões de convidados. São sempre bem-vindas e é muito bom saber o que vai na cabeça de quem ouve. Uma última nota para relembrar que podem tornar-se apoiantes deste projeto através do Patreon, no site www.patreon.com barra 45 graus por extenso. Agradeço desde já aos patronos João Vitor Baltazar, Oscar Sampaio Neves, Ana Mateus e Salvador Cunha pelo apoio muito generoso. Até ao próximo episódio.